Thank you. Mario Murillo is Professor of Communication and Latin American Studies at Hofstra University and is currently the Vice Dean okay. of the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication, a member of the Advisory Board of Hofstra's Center for Civic Engagement. Professor Murillo is a media scholar and award-winning journalist. In his over 30 years in radio, he has served as Program Director, Director of Public Affairs Programming, and a host and producer at WBAI Pacifica Radio in New York, was a feature correspondent at NPR's Latino USA, and served as a regular ghost guest host on WNYC New York Public Radio. He currently hosts a bi-weekly live radio show, Rumba Therapy, on WIOX Community Radio in Roxbury, New York in the Central Catskills region, and is a faculty advisor and producer at WRHU, Hofstra University's award-winning student-run community licensed radio station. He is the author of Columbia and the United States, War, Unrest, and Destabilization, that's uh, 2004, and Islands of Resistance, Puerto Rico, Vieques, and U.S. Policy, that was 2001, and has written and reported extensively about Latin America for a number of publications and journals. He was a 2008-2009 Fulbright Scholar in Colombia, where he worked in the Universidad Pontific Pontificia uh, Las Javierna. <laughs> and you can correct that <laughs> Bogota in its Department of Social Communication. Uh, help me welcome Dr. Mario Murillo. It's early. It's early. And the, you know, usually they tell me not to teach classes at 8, and I have never taught a class at 8 in the void. And so it's really impressive to see okay. all of you here this morning. Thank you. And thank you, Elaine, and everybody from Erase Racism. I feel like I've been hanging out with Erase Racism all week. Elaine came along with Sophia Pertus, the board member, on Saturday. We did an incredible six hour forum with faculty and staff of the Herbert School of Communication, which I happen to be vice dean of, dealing with these issues directly. My faculty were to, you know, they were into it. They, they got into it because of Elaine and because of Sophia and because of the issues that we were talking about. And you don't know how hard it is to get 30 faculty into campus on a Saturday morning. So, uh, and, and I, I, I attribute it to uh, Elaine. My last name is pronounced Murillo. The double L is like a Y, just, just so you know. So I'm gonna, I have a quick, um, I think I did slides. Yep. Where is that? You have a clicker. Where is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah because I'm a, like, like uh, Elaine pointed out, I'm a radio guy and a uh, university professor, so I can be a real windbag. So to keep it down to 12 to eight minutes, not 12 minutes, uh, it's gonna be kind of hard. So um, I, I usually start this off, um, the, the, this discussion. I've done, done this discussion a million times. Other way. The other way? Yeah, I, I kind of, I slapped these things together last night. Uh, these are actually some slides from a number of different classes that I merged together. And I'm not going to talk specific case studies today, which, because we're trying to understand culture and media and how they play a role in, in, in implicit bias and, and uh, uh, structural racism. And I've done this discussion and have had this discussion a million times in classes and community spaces, etc. And I always start with this one anecdote, a personal anecdote of mine. When I first started in radio, I used to be a, a, a first, one of my first radio jobs when I was back in college, back in the mid 80s. Uh, I was a production assistant and later writer and then a later news reporter for 1010 Wins. Have yeah, anybody listen to 1010 Wins? All news all the time, we give you 22 minutes. <laughs> we give you a headache. <laughs> I started there and I was doing an overnight shift as a young, you know, I was, must have been, uh, I think I was a junior in college, and I was working there already, and I was talking to the editor on duty, and he asked me, Mario, are you, are you, are you Italian, Mario Murillo? And I go, no, actually, it's Mario Murillo, and my father is Colombian, he's from Bogota, and my mother's from Puerto Rico, and I'm the fruit of the Latin American experience in New York City, and I was born in New York City, and I'm a 100% Colombo Rican. <laughs> and then, uh, and then the professor, uh, the professor, the editor, about 10 minutes later comes back to me and says, Mario, so does that mean you're too lazy to sell cocaine? 
and he said it in jest, you know, tongue in cheek. And I laughed, and everybody in the newsroom chuckled as well. But you know, here I am, a young man just getting my career started in journalism. But that stuck with me. Look, I'm still telling the story today because that clearly, even though it was a joke, I started thinking, okay, this guy is making decisions of making editorial decisions about the U.S. military intervention in Panama, which happened, a, you know, a little bit later, uh, which was based on drug issues, and supposedly that was the, 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 the motivation for that invasion. Uh, he's making decisions about reports on dropout rates in New York City public schools that are being reported on. He's making decisions about police uh, community relations and, and, and police violence against, against people of color. And then this is his way of thinking, right? And again, that's the little frame that he's looking at the world. And again, perhaps it doesn't it, it, it impact every one of the decisions he's making, but that's the implicit bias that exists in a lot of the media. And again, to try to talk about it. So I'm going to share with you a bunch of different things that come from a lot of different studies. I'd be more than happy to send you links to articles, to research, to all of this. So I'm just going to kind of summarize this. I, and this, I'm doing actually the opposite of what I tell my students to do. Don't, don't sweep, don't critique media with a sweeping brush because there's a lot of different media. Joy Brown, where's Joy? Where did she go? She left. <laughs> Joy Brown's a good example of somebody who doesn't. And, and in fact, her presence in Newsday for so many years has had an impact on Long Island. It you know, led to some of the things that she described. So, so I'm not saying that everybody, but these are some patterns that exist based on a lot of documentation and research. I'm going to look at framing and culture. Framing is something you've, some of you may have heard about. It's, it's really the idea of uh, meaning, of how we find meaning through media. I'm not going to talk about, by the way, entertainment media, because we could spend a whole lot of day talking about film and, and television and commercial television and, and, and entertainment and how that, those implicit biases emerge. But we're going to talk more on news and, and on, on public affairs type of programming. So it's really the frame idea, this idea of, and, you know, I can do the same thing here. I take out my stupid little iPhone, I can take a picture here, and this is a big room. But if I just decide to take a picture here of this side and say, this is the Erase Racism Forum in Melville today, this is what people are going to see. And then all this all other side of the room, nobody's going to see. So that's the idea of the frame. I think it goes without saying. And the idea is that reporters and editors, they choose a storyline that's going to be consistent. The storyline that this is new, right? That, that the changing face of Long Island is new. It's, you know, that's nonsense. We've been seeing it for 40 years, you know, for so many years. Um, so that's one. Uh, and it's really symbolic contests, and again, I spent a lot of time in my classes talking about this, where media norms, and some of those media norms are budget cuts, are, are kind of uh, formalities, you know, the, kind of the inverted pyramid style of writing, this, this, this idea that there's two sides to every story, so as a reporter, we have to report this side and that side, even though we all know in this room that there's many more sides to every story. Um, and so there are media norms, which you can spend a day talking about, and then the political culture, which, uh, and that's what I think is, is pretty important. It's a reflection of, for example, I'm too lazy to sell cocaine, the little anecdote that I shared before. The political culture, which in many ways, and too often, is framed and is led by government officials, quote unquote, expert sources, industry, who are generally uniquely privileged in setting the frame. Right? They're the ones who people go after. Right? These invisible ideas shaped by the dominant culture that are inherent biases. Right? So if we're talking about inherent biases, that's where it comes from. So, and again, if we have more time and perhaps in Q&A we can talk, because I'm not, I should probably, and Elaine asked me to talk about some specific examples on Long Island, and I'm sure all of you can give me the, those specific examples of how these frames uh, <coughs> emanate from the media here on Long Island. Right? Um, you know, when Trump comes to, to make his, his uh, visits to, to Long Island, how are the frames shaped, right? Sure, you have advocates and activists out in the streets protesting, and, and perhaps they'll get some coverage, but who is shaping and making the frame, right? Who are? Social movements, uh, and, I, and I don't use this, I put this word deliberately, marginal. I never use that word, but this idea of marginal groups, us, perhaps you could say, right? We always have the challenge of trying to get through that frame that, that, is, that is already set up. It's already set up. When I was reporting, and I, I'm sure Joy could tell you even more, given her long trajectory as a, as a journalist here on Long Island, you could pitch stories to editors and say, hey, I want to, you know, there's, there's an actual interesting protest or an interesting forum. I mean, are there any journalists covering this? Are any of you reporting? Well, good for you. May the spirits bless you. Right? Um, but when a forum like this, where, where, where advocacy is 
uh, is uh, combining with engagement with community um, to, uh, to address profound issues that are affecting Long Island, and we don't see coverage. Uh, no, we can't. Uh, you know, Elaine, she's an advocate. Let's not worry about her. Let's go cover the, uh, com the Consumer Affairs Commissioner. He's putting out a report uh, at the Vignola Courthouse uh, about uh, safety and Christmas toys. Right? So let's cover that. That's more important. Right? And so that government officials, social, these government officials are going to set the agenda. Industry is going to set the agenda. And then community advocates and, 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 and folks who don't necessarily get that voice are the ones who have, have to break through that clutter. So again, I, I know I'm, you, some of you might, could, could accuse me here of, of, sweeping, of, 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 of speaking with a sweeping brush, a big wide brush, but I'm sure many of you can probably talk about examples that you see regularly in the media, right? We're at an inherent disadvantage in trying to break through that clutter. Uh, and, I, and there's a term that's used, uh, Gapson is so, a scholar who writes about training, use the term mainstream ease, right? And, 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 I, and I really like that, because journalists are generally prone to misunderstand or never hear the alternate language and its underlying ideas, right? They, you need to speak mainstream ease, and I know I have one minute, so I have to shut up soon. Um, but I'll just give you my own personal experience as reporting a lot about the immigrant community here on Long Island, and around, around New York City, not only on Long Island. Um, I remember covering a, a protest in Southampton, and there was an ongoing struggle in Southampton around a, a work site that was being established by, by the local mayor. It's about 10, 12 years ago, I can't remember exactly when. And, and then there were these protesters, supposedly from locals, but really they were mostly from like, outside communities. They weren't even from Southampton, the people who were protesting against them. And they were handing out flyers against these, these immigrant day laborers, flyers that had images of people in California uh, waving the Mexican flag. Right? Uh, I know, I've got to stop. Um, and, and so my feeling was, I'm going to talk to these immigrant workers, and I'm going to speak to them. And I speak to them in Spanish, obviously, and I understand and hear their stories. And, and, so, and, that, and, and, and so then, uh, in the shaping of that story, I can convey something completely different than the other reporters coming in, and, and obviously talking to both, to, to, all, to all sides. So it's really hard. And, and, and so the, the idea of this mainstream is that in order to get your voice heard, you have to kind of fit into that pattern and the patterns of, um, of, of, of what the uh, mainstream culture and the frames that have been established uh, uh, are, are willing to accept. And I was going to, and I know John is shaking his head and he's saying I'm already, I'm already way over time. Um, and, and this, I didn't have time to look into Long Island news agencies, but it would be interesting to perhaps look at that. Um, we know Newsday suffered a major crisis in the last, it's not, it's not the news that we used to know, but Joe Brown is still there, uh, may, the, may, the, may the spirits bless us for that. Um, uh, but if you look at the newsroom diversity around the country, the ASNI is the American Society for Newspaper Editors, and we can look at other surveys that are done, this is newspaper editors, minority journalists comprise 16.6% .6 of the workforce in US newsroom, which is a drop uh, from last year, so this is the latest report. I should say, this is actually 2017 looking at 2016, but it came out in 2018, obviously, they're looking at 2017, so it's a little confusing, but it, it doesn't matter, that's nitpicking. Online only news organizations is about 24% are so-called um, journalists of color, right? Um, and, um, and it said 25.5% of all news organizations, we're talking print and, and online newspapers, reported having at least one minority journalist among their top three editors. So that's a small percentage of, of, of a large chunk of media. And if you look at TV news, you see similar, similar trends, um, and, and, pra and perhaps worse. And then finally, just this last one, and I'm not sure if this works out, in all markets, and this is where we could look at Long Island, hopefully, maybe I, I, if I had time, I should have probably done this myself, due diligence. In all markets, the number of minority staffers, and I use that term loosely, again, this is the language they use, not mine, uh, the number of minority staffers in newsrooms is far below the percentage of people of color in the communities they serve. So let's look at Long Island, the numbers that were here in the graph earlier. And so it would be interesting to know Newsday, News 12, and some of the other local media, what are the, what's the composition, the demographic composition, right? The NAHJ, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, the NABJ, the National Association of Black Journalists, are calling and continue to call for a renewed commitment to diversity. And the loss of journalists of color is outpacing overall job losses. We all know there's a crisis in news media. The budgets are being cut, the media are closing, media are changing, obviously the, the, the online uh, explosion has transformed in many ways. And the loss of journalists of color 
are larger than the, 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 than the broader numbers of journals. So what, what impact does that do? I mean, some people will say, well, you don't have to be black to cover the black community. You don't have to be Latino to cover the Latino community. Yeah, you're probably true, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're true, but, but if, you're, if you're good at what you do. But let's keep in mind the idea of framing again and, and, and recognize that there is a difference. There will, and there will be an ultimate difference. And so I, if I had another half hour or 45 minutes, uh, we can go into specifics. I had stuff around the immigrant, immigrant rights uh, movement. Uh, we have stuff around the Black Lives Matter movement that we can perhaps get into some of those things uh, when we do Q&A. So apologies for completely overstepping my <laughs> Thank you.